we've got Jan Tanetti, the Labour Party spokesperson for education. How are you going, Jan? I'm really good, and I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. Now, now, since I have both of you here, I'm going to correct you both on something that you do wrong, because I, I've noticed it pop up a couple of times. Um, Jan, you sent me a really wonderful video not that long ago, and Blake, you start some of your videos the same way I do, but you both start off with, well, hello there. And there's no well in there. It's just straight up hello there. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to remember. Yeah, for next time. I, I fear that I may be a bit too old, though. Some of these things that people pick me up on, I fear that they're so ingrained because I've just been on this earth for far too long to oh, change my ways. But I do try. I think it's one of those Mandela effect things that everybody kind of remembers that Star Wars quote is starting that way. And it doesn't always, but yeah. That, that, that's my one little bugbear. It's obviously, it's obviously a bugbear of yours, so I'll try not that's to do that. Just, just a little. But now everybody knows going forward, and I'm sure all the comments are going to start off with, well, hello there from now on. It'll be great fun. <laughs> yes, um, hey, Jane, you've had a pretty interesting time of it recently when it comes to education and what's happening in government at the moment. Um, we're seeing the return again of charter schools. We're seeing... Um, changes to things like the maths curriculum being brought forward based on erroneous data that the government is using to try and justify their changes. Um, I'm kind of curious, what is sort of the big, scary, overarching feeling for you at the moment about these changes? What, what, what's your fear of the outcome of these changes? There's so much that I'm in fearful of in the education space at the moment. It is in, a, in essence, it's taking us backwards rather than forward. We've got really big issues that are hitting us as a country, as a globe at the moment, and this is taking us back to the 1950s, but there's also this very hidden agenda that I see as well around privatisation of the education system and control over the education system. You know, with the charter schools, for example, that is the biggest threat to a quality public education system. If we're talking quality public education, which has always been my number one goal in education, charter schools is the polar opposite of that. And charter schools will take us into a really dark place in education. We have, uh, on one hand, a government that says all schools have to be doing this, all schools have to be teaching literacy and maths in this certain way and then on the other hand saying oh but if you don't like that sign up to a charter school system and you can do it your way and really that's inviting business in that's inviting privatization and it's sort of giving people this false hope of flexibility because i can tell you that the research shows that there is no flexibility that you've still got central control over what happens and that they can change that at any stage that they want to. So while it might sound appealing right at the beginning, anywhere else that that's happened in the world, it, that flexibility quickly erodes and is taken away and we have business having their tentacles right over education. We don't want that for our kids. We want to go forward. I was talking last night to people involved in the AI area and the tech sector who are really scared about the fact that we're losing flexibility. We're losing that problem solving that we as Kiwis are world renowned for, uh, for something that is essentially central government control. Also, one last thing I'll say in that space is that the education system is mo their morale at the moment is the lowest I've ever seen it. And I thought that I'd never ever see it get lower than what it was when national standards was in, but it is exceptionally low. And also this change that's being foisted upon them is so fast. It is, they just can't do it. They cannot change a whole sector in that particular way. So I'm really scared for our kids. I'm really scared for our future. And this government has got it completely yeah. wrong. Um, with some of the statistics that we have seen on recent programming, like Q&A and uh, the news and so forth, um, do, do you feel with, some of those numbers that they are using being so low that the Labour Party could have done more. So they're using they are using numbers wrong and they are telling false stories. So they're trying to use they're trying to tell their narrative to make it sound like nothing was happening. 
So we know that there were some changes that were needed in curriculum, which is why we were doing a curriculum refresh, but we were bringing the sector with us, which was really important. What this government has done is they've created a false crisis. They have said that uh, the testing, that we were changing our testing way of testing what was happening within the system, but we were using that first test against the draft curriculum to create benchmarks for future testing going forward. This is a curriculum that no kids have ever been taught, and yet they said that only 22% of the kids are doing maths at the moment. They've been tested against a curriculum that has not been taught. Of course they're not going to pass. That's just how it is. But that doesn't mean to say they're not doing maths, and that doesn't mean to say that they're not where they should be. Now, we know that our system testing showed issues at the year eight level having set in the past and that's why we were looking at those changes is what's happening between year four and year eight and that's why we were making those changes so to say that we were doing nothing was disingenuous but also to say that kids are failing is completely disingenuous and creating their own crisis so that they can bring in a really really they're calling it structured maths, but a really, really narrow, narrow focus on the teaching of maths. And that really concerns me. They're using countries in the world, such as Singapore, as the example. Now, Singapore have spent years working on their maths curriculum. They didn't put something in overnight. They have spent years and years and years trialing. And I know that people that I know in Singapore that work in this area are horrified to think that they're being held up as the so-called greater system and horrified that anyone would think that they could just lift and shift what they do and have spent years creating to their country and put it in overnight. And that is a huge concern as well. So it's a manufactured crisis, as I said, I'm not saying that there's not things to build on. We certainly have got things to build on. But the fact that they've pulled data out of uh, and presented it in a disingenuous way and what the New Zealand Principals Federation are calling disinformation, which is pretty strong when you've got the New Zealand Principals Federation, who are not a union, and nothing wrong with unions, love them, but they're not a union, they are the professional body for school principals, and they're calling it disinformation. That is pretty strong, and I would be really concerned if I was the government and had a body like that calling me out in that way. Have you had much feedback from parents about these changes? Yeah, I have actually. Um, now, the minister herself, I asked her a question in the house yesterday and she was quoting some emails that she's had. I was calling out at the same time, be honest, because be honest about the, the emails that you probably didn't say it quite like that, because that would say that I was being, I was accusing her of being dishonest, but I was having a say, you know, tell us, tell us the, the, um, the emails that you're getting that show the opposite because I know because I get a lot that come to me and I know that they would be going to the minister as well. So I'm having parents that are really concerned about uh, these changes that are happening overnight. They're really concerned about the throwing, let's use an analogy, the throwing the baby out of the bathwater sort of idiom that, that, that they're really concerned about. They're concerned that uh, some of the programs that have helped their kids along the way are just being demonised, such as Reading Recovery, for example. It's been completely demonised, and I'm really feeling for the people that are working in that space because they have done a really good job in a program that has been additive over years and has been iterative over years, so has changed in the way that it's being delivered. So I'm, you know, parents are really concerned. Of course there's going to be parents that are out there saying, oh, this is a good thing because that's how I learned. The world's moved on and we've got to be aware that the world has moved on. You know, again, I take it back to that conversation that I had last night with people working in the AI area. I don't think people realise how big of a change that is making right now. And I think if we're going back to a 1950s curriculum, we are, we're so far behind the eight ball of what the rest of the world is doing in this space 
that it is such a concern for our kids. The other aspect I'd say is that I'm getting a lot of feedback from parents of disabled children who are really concerned that it's a one size fits all and their kids are not going to be having their needs met because they're not going to be front and centre of what's happening. Mm. Um, you talk about you want to, if you are successful into getting into government 2026, you want to re-abolish the charter schools. Now, we heard you talk about this in recent weeks. Just a reminder, what will you do if you can't break contract? So we will get legal advice around the contract side of it and we will take it a case by case, but I can guarantee that we will get rid of charter schools. There will be a way that we can look at how we put legislation in place. We definitely, those schools that are state schools that are looking to um, become charter schools, there is no way that they can stay like that. They will have to come back into the state system. We will look at the special character side of the legislation and which is what happened last time. But I'm quite hard about this. They are a big, charter schools are a big um, threat to the public education system. There is no place in a country of 5 million or just over 5 million for charter schools to exist. We have an issue in our schooling system as it is because we are the most devolved education system in the world. There is not a system that is devolved as ours. That causes issues because it's really hard to get that systemic change. We don't need to devolve it even more. We're, essentially what charter schools do is it means that we're just creating another layer in a, la in a schooling system that has too many layers in it now. And we need to look at how we can stop that. So we will be getting legal advice. We are talking to people now around that. Um, it's really hard to know because we haven't seen what the contracts will look like yet. We've got the legislation that's going through select committee at the moment. Certainly I'm working through that. I can't talk a lot about that because all of that stuff is within select committee. So I can't talk about what I'm seeing, but that's giving us a way forward around how we stop this. This is my number one goal that I am working on. Everything in education, interlinked but charter schools will be the biggest threat to anything else progressing in this country if it's going through select committee at the moment yeah how are there 75 or 78 applications or whatever it is that david seymour has been talking about yeah so so it's going through select committee i felt that that announcement was again a pretty appalling announcement that was made um in the fact that yeah, we know that they've got the majority, so they're going to probably pass that legislation. But actually, legis select committees are supposed to be independent and be able to come up with their own um, way forward. And I felt that that was a bit of a, a bad faith towards the work of what the select committee is doing. So just, again, it smacks of an arrogance of this government to do that. Um, I, I actually, there was a point though, and, and I don't know that the media have even picked up on this, is that, that he made a big thing about that announcement and we've got all these people and they're all interested. He has budgeted for 15 new charter schools and 35 to convert from the state system. He only had 10 schools that were interested in converting. So that's 10 out of 35. So is it as exciting is what he's claiming it to be. He's over egging a situation which to, seems to me to be a real fizzer. Um, I'm disappointed that there's 10, but I'm also excited that there's 10 because it's not 35 and it's not gonna take hold. He has um, IOIA'd some material that he was working with um, different companies and that, that was, were giving him suggestions about how to get charter schools embedded that we couldn't get rid of them. And one of those was around um, getting enough charter schools in the system. He wanted way more. He wanted way more than the 50 that he's been given the budget for. He wanted hundreds of them. He's not getting hundreds, you know, even 75. He is not getting hundreds. This is not a big uptake as to what he's claiming it to be. So, you know, it's, it's something that this country, I believe, understands that 
how bad this can be for the system and that we don't want to create a system that um, diversifies more. But can I just make this point? We know that there are young people in the system currently who the system is not serving well. But we were doing work around an alternative pathway for those kids. Now, at the moment, we call it alternative education. I hate that term because it makes it sound like kids have failed in the education system. And I don't want any kid feeling like they have failed within the system. So we were doing that work and that's another part of the work that I'm currently working on is what can we do that's within the system that will work within the system and work for local schools so that no kid feels that they're isolated from the system, that our neurodiverse kids feel that they are, are being catered for, that our disabled kids feel they're being catered for, that our, our kids that have trauma in their lives feel that they're catered for. We can do it. You know, it's not just a dream, we can do it. The other part of that is that uh, I understand when Māori are very attracted to the charter school model because the education system has let them down. They are at the bottom of a lot of statistics. But I actually think all you're doing is getting another state-created system that is not for, by Māori for Māori system. So what I believe is that we had a Waitangi tribunal decision that was made a couple of weeks ago that said uh, Māori, we, we, we lost the opportunity and we were wrong in losing the opportunity in the Tomorrow's Schools Review for Māori to create their own system. We have a world-renowned education, Indigenous education system now, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't do better. And so I believe that it's time now for discussions to happen around what a by Māori, for Māori system can look like and that that's not for me to determine what that is going to look like. That's for me to be part of the discussions, but it's actually for Māori to determine that. And so that's the next thing. I heard someone say to me the other day that Māori are our superpower that we take to the world. And absolutely in the education space they are because every single Minister of Education and other jurisdictions that I have spoken to always comes up and says to, or used to say to me when I was Minister, what can we do to reflect what you do in that Māori education because you have the number one standard in the world. But as I say, we should feel proud of that, but we can do better. Um, two final questions from me. So um, how a bit of a funny one, actually. How do you feel about us seeing David Seymour more than uh, Erica Stanford when it comes to ed education <laughs> announcements? Well, I think um, I think David Seymour is bringing in a privatised agenda. I'm not certain that David Seymour is actually uh, interested in kids at the centre, and I only look, need to look at what he's doing to early childhood at the moment. And so I get frustrated at working and talking with him because he he doesn't even acknowledge the kids. At least Erica is acknowledging the kids. But I will say that Erica, she has a way of... Um, sort of bringing people on board with her ideas, which people think that she's quite good in that space. And I actually think that's quite dangerous at the same time because her ideas, again, are taking us back to the 50s. So I don't like, I have to say I'm not in favour of either of them because they're very different ways, but both of them are just doing ultimate damage to education. I know there will be some people that disagree with me in that space, but I can tell you that going back to a curriculum that she is talking about is going to send our kids backwards, not take them forward. So both of them are, yeah, I, I hate, I hate, um, I hate being misrepresented by both of them because that's what they do, and I hate that misrepresentation. But that's not going to make me stop either. I am determined that I'm going to be the voice in education to go forward. That's the real, the real voice of education. Mm. And will you look at legislation to see if you can permanently ban charter schools? Yes, I will. Absolutely. Well, I think if we, when we get back in. We need to put them to bed, and I think that will be the last time we will ever hear of them because they will be a complete failed experiment twice. They've failed once. We will see them fail again. Yeah, and you'll make it so that they can't be reversed? 
Yeah, well, that's what the, the hope is. Like, any government can basically come in and do what they want, but the hope is, is that um, it, we're going to get the public support. I don't think we did, and I've said this, I don't think, because we, we happened quite quickly last time, I don't know that we did a good enough job of bringing the public with us. I feel more now that the public's with us. One of the reasons for that last time was because we didn't have a clear alternative for some of those real big issues like Māori education. I think we have to come in with an alternative and say, and the alternative work as well. We have to come in with that and say, this is a much stronger, but it's within the public system. Thank you. I'll hand that to Paul to wrap up. Thank you. I was going to say, that, that's us pretty much for time, because I know you've got a bit of a hard stop on us. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Jan. It has been a great pleasure having you here. I've learned lots from the former education minister. It's <laughs> Hey, well thank you, Paul and Blake. I just love that. I, I always love talking education. So anytime you want to do that, please, happy to talk education. See, see for me, I think the biggest failing, but the biggest evidence of failing in our past education systems is the fact that you have so many people who can look at the numbers that are presented by something like the National or ACT parties and not realise just how bad they are. It just shows you that yeah. people didn't get the education that they needed to be able to decipher information and critically think things but that's just yeah me. yeah and that's you know that's exact good place to end because that's exactly what this government is trying to do it's almost to dumb our population down and i hate saying that because kiwis are not known for that we're known for punching above our weight mm -hmm. absolutely right we'll wrap it up there thank you very much thank you loved it